To offer proper protection, we need to set clear environmental standards with explicit targets around what we value as a country and what our laws need to protect. This will require a fundamental reform of our national environmental laws and empowering a new environmental protection agency to enforce them. We need trust and transparency. Decisions need to be built on good data to show the public how we're tracking in real time, data that can be shared so we don't keep collecting the same information again and again, but instead we build over time a useful, usable, rich picture of our environment. We also need certainty and efficiency. This will allow us to speed up most processes so we can build new housing, construct renewable energy projects, lay the roads that connect our communities, better environmental outcomes and faster, clearer decisions. For too long, people have seen these goals as mutually exclusive. They're not. They're not. Good environmental law is also good economic reform. That's why, by agreement with the Treasurer, the historic wellbeing budget will also include environmental indicators. As the Treasurer said recently, it's really important that we measure what matters in our economy, in addition to all of the traditional measures, not instead of, but in addition to. Because this is not a conflict between jobs and the environment. We have got to go beyond that thinking when we reform our environmental laws. To help guide that change, I'm announcing that by the end of the year, the Australian Government will formally respond to the Samuel Review. We'll then develop new environmental legislation for 2023. We'll consult thoroughly on environmental standards. But in the meantime, I want to see an immediate start on improving our environmental data and regional planning establishing a shared view around what needs to be protected and restored, the areas where development can occur with minimal consequences. I'm not naive. I know that improving our environmental laws is going to be challenging. People will have very different ideas about what national environmental standards should look like. And as Minister, I will probably make some calls that some people disagree with but I am absolutely determined to improve the system. The truth is that everyone will have to give a bit to achieve real, lasting national progress. It's encouraging to know that groups with very different interests work to find common ground during the Samuel Review. Business, industry, environmentalists, scientists, traditional owners, farmers, unions, and your standard keen bushwalker like me, came to the table to see what kind of progress could be made. I want to work across the board to build on that goodwill because ambition is really important, but it's not much good without achievement. I understand that campaigns to stop individual projects will motivate and energise some people. Others will want to focus on a particular species or a particularly beautiful place. I know these campaigns can capture the public imagination, but in my judgment, what the environment really needs is a changed system. That's the message from the Samuel Review. That's the message from the State of the Environment report. Without structural change, we'll be resigning ourselves to another decade of failure without the tools we need to arrest our decline. We all want to pass on a healthy environment to our children and grandchildren. And that's why I'm also happy to announce today that we will expand Australia's national estate. Our government will set a goal of protecting 30% of our land and 30% of our oceans by 2030. We'll explore the creation of new national parks and marine protected areas, including by pursuing the East Antarctic Marine Park. This will be the latest chapter in a very proud Labor story. Labor protected Kakadu, the Dane Tree, the Great Barrier Reef, Antarctica, and the Tasmanian World Heritage Area. And as Minister, I intend to add to that legacy. 
The State of the Environment report also makes it clear that we have to do a better job of repairing environmental damage. Too much clearing of habitat has already occurred. Too many ecosystems and species are under threat. We can't just stop future destruction, although this is essential and the most cost-effective way to address the environmental crisis. We also need to actively repair past damage. The Australian Land Conservation Alliance estimates that we need to spend over a billion dollars a year to restore and prevent further landscape degradation. The scale of this challenge means that governments can't do it alone. We need to work with industry and with philanthropic partners, many of whom are already doing terrific work. I want to look at ways of making this investment easier to support land-based carbon projects that deliver biodiversity, improve drought resilience and drive agricultural productivity, and to ensure that we prioritise the most important areas for ecological restoration. Better data, laws that focus on outcomes and good regional planning will help protect and restore the places with the greatest carbon and biodiversity value. We'll also support investment in blue carbon projects, restoration of mangroves, tidal marshes and seagrasses that, pro uh, that um, provide habitat for marine life, support our fisheries and protect our coastlines from rising waters and storm surges. And Australian scientists describe these places as the blue diamond of carbon storage. And he's right, these environments are precious absorbing carbon at up to five times the rate of tropical rainforests and storing it for thousands of years. The State of the Environment also tells us the urgent need to uh, better manage our waste and to actively manage the places that we have vowed to protect.